You know, if this was a new fad, that'd be one thing. A new fad of eating the kind of diet I recommend, which, for those of you who don't know, is a diet based on starch, like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils, with the addition of fruits and vegetables. In fact, that's a sentence. That, that one sentence, and I'll follow it by another sentence, really describes my program. The McDougall program is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. The second sentence is it contains no animal foods and no free oils. Free oils being like olive oil, corn oil, etc. That's the, that's the McDougall program. Well, that's the kind of diet that we've been living by and teaching for many years. And you need to know that this is not a fad, and that's what this lecture is about, is the fact that this is not a fad. I know you hear about all kinds of different diets out there. You hear about the paleo diet and the Atkins diet and, you know, don't eat very much food diets and all kinds of diets. But the kind of diet that I'm teaching you has a solid history behind it. And the best way for me to share this history with you is to tell you a little bit of how I uh, got involved with it and also introduce you to some of my friends along the way. Mary and I met in 1971 in September at Blodgett Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we were in the operating room. She was an operating room nurse, and I was a senior medical student, and I fell in love <laughs> instantly. It wasn't the same for her, but, you know, it was, uh, it was one of those things where my parents told me when I was growing up, they said, son, when you meet the right woman, you will know if you're honest with yourself. And she certainly wasn't the first woman I'd met. But when I did meet her, I knew she was the right one. And so we met in 19, uh, 1971, September. It took me about three weeks before I could get a date, but I finally did. And then it worked out really well. We were in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is, well, in my opinion, not the most ideal place in the world to live. Better than Detroit, which is where I was raised. But uh, there seemed to be greener pastures for us. And we decided that we were going to leave Grand Rapids, Michigan after my medical school training. But fortunately, something very important happened to me before we left, is I was attending, in the winter of 1971, I was attending a noontime medical conference. Now, noontime medical conferences for medical students are a little overwhelming. And it was really kind of frustrating for me to go to these noontime medical conferences like at Blodgett Hospital and hear the doctors talk about all the ailments of my patients and never really tell me how to get them well. I mean, that's why I became a doctor. My dad always told me, the greatest reward in life, son, is to help other people, and the greatest opportunity to help other people is to be a doctor. And so I was so excited to gain those skills and to share with other people. And unfortunately, I'd go to these noontime conferences, and doctors would talk about the signs and symptoms of disease, the genetic relationships, maybe the possibility of a virus, or when we really got down to it, it was the patient's fault. They were overstressed and neurotic. I never saw a way to help my patients get well until one noontime conference I heard a man called Dr. Dennis Burkett speak. Dr. Dennis Burkett uh, was visiting Battle Creek, Michigan to talk to the Kellogg's food company, the cereal maker, and was trying to convince them to feed people more fiber. Dr. Dennis Burkett, he was a surgeon and he trained in Edinburgh, Scotland. And after his training in Edinburgh, Scotland, he left with a couple of his friends, and they went to Uganda in Africa to practice medicine. And he eventually became the head of ministries of health in Uganda. And that gave him the opportunity to oversee more than 10 million people during his 17 years as the head of the ministries of health in Uganda. And Dr. Burkett uh, told me some very fascinating stories about these people who lived in Africa. He identified their diet as high fiber. Well, I didn't realize it then, but of course I know now, as all you do, that fiber is only present in plant foods. These people lived on a high fiber diet. They ate basically plants. They ate corn and grains and vegetables. That was their diet in Uganda. And then he told me that he didn't see any of the common illnesses that we see in our country, in the United States. He didn't see heart disease. No, he said he saw one case of heart disease. There was a uh, judge who trained in London, went back to Uganda, and had a heart attack. He saw one heart attack in 17 years. Yeah, he saw one case of gallstones in 17 years. He saw none of the common diseases that I was used to seeing in his time in Uganda. And after he learned all these things, he came back and tried to share the message with people all around the world, and he did. Very famous doctor. Had audiences all over the globe to share this very basic fundamental message of how you get well. Well, I heard this in 1971, but that was only a little glimmer of what was going on 
in my future. I just had a, a slight indication that there was something else to learn. Well, after an, Mary and I did our time in Michigan, which was about 25 years, we decided to escape. We picked, looked at all kinds of places to go that would be a little bit warmer, a little bit nicer, like Florida and Texas, and we even considered California. But that wasn't enough for us. We were really ready to change our lives. And so we left and moved to Honolulu, Hawaii. And I stayed there for a year as an intern. I was actually a surgical intern. I worked hard, learned a few things, but I fell in love with Hawaii. And I didn't want to leave. And that was in 1972. And then 1973 came along, and I was faced with either being unemployed or getting a job. And a job was offered to me on the Big Island of Hawaii. That changed my life. We moved to the Big Island of Hawaii, and I worked on a sugar plantation. And I took care of 5,000 people on this sugar plantation. And that's where I learned about being a doctor. I was basically the only doctor for 41 miles. I had to do everything. I caught 100 babies during those three years. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. Whatever was wrong with you, I had to take care of because there was nobody else there. Now, I took care of your, quote, mundane problems, like your high blood pressure and your constipation and your blood pressure and your fatness and all those things, too. And what I found out was with these chronic ailments, I couldn't help. Nobody seemed to get better. No matter how hard I tried, and I had better expectations for myself. Remember, I was raised at the age of Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare, and Marcus Welby. So I knew how a real doctor was supposed to perform. And my patients, just plain and simple, would not get well. And so I felt very frustrated as a doctor. And then another thing that happened to me is I learned about good eating from my patients again. I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. And what I saw was a drastic difference in health as the generations changed. First generation, they'd learned a diet in the Philippines or in Japan or China, a diet of rice and vegetables. And then they moved to Hawaii for a new life on the plantation. And they kept their diet of rice and vegetables, no dairy, very little meat. But the second generation, their kids, they became influenced by Western eating. And they ate more meat, less rice. And they got a little fatter and a little sicker. By the time you got to the third generation, you could see the damaging effects of the American diet. These third generation and fourth generation Filipinos, Chinese, Chinese Japanese, and Koreans were fat and sick, just like the, the people that I learned medicine on back in Michigan. Yes. And so by the time I left in 1976, we spent three years there. We had our first two children there. By the time I left, I was pretty clear about the importance of diet all starting with Dennis Burkett opening my eyes in 1971. It wasn't until I came back from 20 years surgical practice in Africa that I was helped largely by others to appreciate that most of the common chronic diseases filling the hospital beds in Western countries today are rare or unknown in the third world were there even in North America before the First World War, are equally common in black and white Americans, and therefore they have to be due to our lifestyle, the way we live, and in which case they've got to be preventable if we can identify the factors in our lifestyle. So when you talk about lifestyle, when you talk about things being different in different parts of the planet, when you talk about uh, about epidemiology and environmental diseases, the first thing you want to think about is the food. Because that's where we contact the environment is with our food. Yes, we contact it with water and air also, but that's small compared to food. In terms of number of molecules that touch our body with air, and the kinds of molecules. Air is just, what, carbon dioxide, water, a little nitrogen, a few pollutants. Water, that's supposed to be just H2O. Food, you're talking about tens of thousands of different kinds of chemical substances and a huge amount of molecules that contact us. So when people talk about differences in disease present in different parts of the world, the first thing you have to think about is the food, as Dr. Dennis Burkert was telling us. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world, 
who don't get the common diseases of Western culture. And when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, navicular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. Dr. Burkett, I remember when he gave that noontime presentation, he showed a slide. This is the best I can remember that slide from 1971. <laughs> what he showed is a slide which uh, represented a small bowel movement alongside of a big hospital. The message being, if you eat a low fiber diet, you're going to get both. You're going to get small bowel movements, and you're going to have a sick population of people. And those people who had big bowel movements, they had need for very little medicine and very little hospitals. Again, fiber means plants. Fiber is only present in plant foods. There's no fiber in cheese, in beef, pork, chicken, fish, none at all. So the makeup of the stool being primarily affected by dietary fiber is a message that he focused on a lot. But he understood the difference. In the interview I did with him in 1990 at Loma Linda University, he talked about, he understood it wasn't just fiber. He knew that it was plants. He knew that it was starch. He mentioned starch here, didn't he? Starch being the sugar that's in this, the plants that I recommend to you, the rice, the corn, the potatoes, and so on. He knew that the animal foods were a problem and the fats were a problem. But he was known as the fiber man. And I guess that was easier for me to, so to speak, swallow back in 1971, because it was just fiber. All I had to do was taste, take and maybe sprinkle a little bit of Miller's bran over my bacon and eggs, and everything would be fine. <laughs> but that's not what he was trying to tell me. It's just that all, that was all I was willing to listen to at that particular point in my life. It took many years before I heard the rest of his message. Well, you see, I spent years recognizing that fiber related to bowel behavior, recognizing that in people who had adequate bowel behavior, they virtually never had a lot of our Western diseases. And I really copied the example of my friend Alec Walker in South Africa, who has looked at thousands of stools. But you see, now we know from the evidence available that the average American who isn't a vegetarian only passes about 80 to 130 grams of stool a day. In people who, and elderly people under 50. Um, whereas in countries who don't get bowel cancer, breast cancer, gallstones, coronary heart disease, so on, they pass three to 500 grams of stool a day. And I think we are genetically, as it were, coded or, or made to get on with far more fiber than we take. And I think, our relationship to, well, there was always causative relationship, but our relationship to a lot of our Western diseases is related to what I might call our national constipation. <laughs> so, Dr. Burkett, he's talked to you about starch. Some of you wonder why I called the book The Starch Solution, because scientifically that's the correct terminology. The source of energy that you want to get in your diet is from starch. It's complex carbohydrate, that's one way, way of describing it. But this is the, the energy source that you must focus on, just like his patients in Uganda, just like the rest of the world who is healthy and trim. They live on starch, like rice, corn, potatoes. Easily you can think of populations such as in Asia who live on rice-based diets. You think back in history, what you learned in school, you remember that the Mayans and Aztecs lived on corn. And the Incas, a little further south, they lived on potatoes until they went to battle, and then they switched to quinoa. Our attention these days in the news is on the Middle East. Well, the people you see in the news in the Middle East, they're rather trim looking. Well, part of it is you might say they don't have a lot of food, but the main reason is, is these people live on rice and chickpeas. 71% of their diet is carbohydrate. And that part of the world was known as the breadbasket of the world. Throughout all of human history, almost every single person has lived on a starch-based diet. Or more generally, I can say to you, 
that all large, successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. It's only when people become rich that they abandon the starch and they get into the meat and dairy. Just to be practical in terms of everyday foods that people yeah. eat, can you name a few foods that you'd like to see people eat more of? Oh yes, oh yes. I think we ought to eat far more foods made of cereals in general, particularly bread. Our ancestors ate between a pound, about a pound and a quarter per head per day of bread, always brown flour. We in Europe, in England, eat under a quarter of a pound a day. I think bread is a, a brown bread, not white bread, brown or wholemeal bread is a very healthy diet. I'd like to see. Now, peas and beans are extraordinarily good because they're high in soluble fiber which is good from the point of view of diabetes and coronary heart disease. I think potatoes are very good. They're high in potassium. And Western man is the only mammal alive who eats more uh, sodium than potassium. I think potatoes, as long as they are neither cooked or eaten with fat, are a slimming diet. They are very nutritious. They tell me that there's almost no other diet which can't, contains almost everything a human being uh, needs. I could emphasize that I know through studying the scientific literature and experiments that have been done in the early 1900s and late 1800s, they actually took people and they raised them on diets of potatoes and water alone. And they thrived for six months, a year and a half. Probably in natural situations, people have thrived for much longer than that in uh, Russia and in Poland are just two examples where that's all people had during difficult times was potatoes. And what I want to emphasize is a simple diet is very nutritious. As Dr. Burkett said, people can live on potatoes and water alone. You can live on grains and beans, but you have to add a little bit of fruit or vegetable for vitamin C. Like you could live on rice with a slice or two of orange or a flour out of bro uh, broccoli. You do just fine. As far as uh, the things that people are worried about, now some of you who are new to this, I'm sure you're sitting and thinking to yourself, oh boy, this is completely different than everything I hear now and have heard of in the past. And then your next thoughts after Dr. Burke and I have shocked you with the idea that you need to live on potatoes and bread and corn and rice, just like everybody else has. The next thing you're thinking to yourself, well, that can't be. How can I get necessary calcium and protein if I don't include dairy? and meat, words synonymous with calcium and protein. You know, you're talking about a vegetarian diet. Now say we consider the ideal diet a vegetarian diet, can you think of any reasons to add meat to that diet? No, no need, no need to. How no. about dairy products? Any reason to add dairy well, products to the diet? Well, some people would say that if you add dairy products, you're, you've got to get, you're, you'll have your vitamin B12, you're less likely to get pernicious anemia. And see, there are relatively few in England vegans. There's a lot of vegetarians, but very few vegans. I don't think um, a vegetarian diet is a healthy diet. I, I wouldn't be able, I, I wouldn't be authoritative to talk on the diet with no milk or eggs, but certainly a vegetarian diet can be a very, very healthy diet. It's been the diet of the, most of the Japanese throughout history, and they have the longest life expectancy of any country in the world. So you don't consider calcium an issue as far as dairy products? No, because communities who don't drink milk at all after childhood suffer almost not at all from osteoporosis in old age. But you don't see people in an African village walking around with their chin on their chest from osteoporosis. And age adjusted and Africans in South Africa have only one eleventh the risk of getting femoral neck fractures. And they have a lower calcium intake in their diet than we have. So whatever it is, I, don't, I doubt whether taking calcium tablets really does much help. About this same time, uh, there were other people who were trying to make a difference in this country. Uh, like uh, Governor um, McGovern, George McGovern, and he got together, oh, excuse me, Senator McGovern, Senator McGovern, South Dakota, right? 
Yeah, Senator McGovern. He uh, uh, was uh, uh, in, in the Senate at that time, and his interest was trying to make America a better place. You know, there are senators who do try and do this. They try and help us have a better life. I mean, that's their job, is to try and make a better life for people. And he realized that uh, people were getting sick because of the foods that we we're eating. And I know that one of the efforts of Senator McGovern was, uh, Senator George McGovern, was to uh, make people healthier, similar to the way that uh, the Surgeon General of 1964 made people healthier by publishing the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. So he wanted to do the same thing for Americans with another uh, governmental action, and this would be a Senate Select Committee on Nutrition that would look at the available evidence, and as a result of looking at the evidence, they would make recommendations. And so they put out, in February of 1977, they put out the dietary goals for the United States 36 years ago. And uh, part of that dietary goals is a, a statement by Dr. Mark Hagstead, and Dr. Mark Hickstead said in this 1977 document, there's a great deal of evidence and it continues to accumulate, which strongly implicates in some instances proves that the major causes of death and disability in the United States are related to the diet we eat. I include coronary artery disease, which accounts for nearly half of the deaths in the United States, several of the most important forms of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, as well as other chronic diseases. 1977. And then the report went on and it said, the question to be asked, therefore, is not why should we change our diet, but why not? What are the risks associated with eating less meat, less fat, less saturated fat, less cholesterol, less sugar, less salt, more fruits, vegetables, unsaturated fats, cereal products, especially whole grain cereals? There are none that can be identified and important benefits can be expected. Ischemic heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension are the diseases that kill us. They are epidemic in our population. We cannot afford to temporize. We have an obligation to inform the public of the current state of knowledge and to assist the public in making the correct food choices. To do, le to do less is to avoid our responsibility. And that lasted for a few months until the meat and dairy industry put their pressures on our government and made them change the dietary goals before the end of 1977. It is the responsibility of the government at all levels to take the initiative in creating for Americans an appropriate nutritional atmosphere, one conducive to the improvement of health and the quality of American life. The government is to protect the community against foreign and domestic threats. That's my statement. That's the purpose of the government. Now, I know many of you have different political views. And we're not here to discuss those. But I think all of us can agree the job of the government is to protect us from threats that are foreign and domestic. The biggest domestic threat in this country is the diet that consists primarily of livestock. There's the threat. Yay. And industry has done everything industry is supposed to do. These aren't vile, mean people that are plotting to hurt you and your family. They're just doing business. You know, these people in the dairy and the meat and the pork and the chicken and the fish industries, their families are sick too. They're fat too. They're on all kinds of medications too. It's not like they're maliciously trying to hurt you. They're just trying to do business. And they do everything possible to do business, to make a profit, to keep the stockholders happy. That's what business does. And so they'll even enroll as many allies as they can in government, in medicine. I love this particular advertisement, which appeared in the Arlington Times in 1962. A statement is, the anti-fat, anti-cholesterol fat is not just foolish and futile, however, it also carries some risks. And you know who they got involved in this particular statement? Is the American Medical Association. And who paid for this ad? The Washington Dairy Products Commission. So for as long as I've been paying attention to this, industry has done whatever they can to continue to sell their products. Even if it involves getting doctors and researchers and medical journals and government and everybody that's necessary involved in keeping people in the marketplace. As they did last week when they published the New England Journal of Medicine article telling you you need to eat olive oil and nuts to be healthy. 
I know, that, that got your attention. I know all of you were really upset because your friends all came to you and said, look, a low-fat diet doesn't help. This study showed it in the New England Journal of Medicine, published in February of 2013. That's what your friends told you. A low-fat diet doesn't help because they compared a Mediterranean diet, whatever that is, probably more fruits and vegetables. They say more olive oil. They say more nuts. They compared a vegetarian diet with a low-fat diet, but uh, they didn't have a low-fat diet to compare with. They didn't teach people to follow a low-fat diet. In fact, when you read the study, you find the fat intake in the low-fat group decreased from 39% to 37%. Excuse me. And your friends say a low-fat diet doesn't work. The diet I'm teaching you is 7% fat. And the benefits seen in this study, even though they advertised it in the media as dramatically reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease, there was no reduction in heart attacks. There was no reduction in overall death, which is what you care about. And there was a small reduction in strokes. That's it. And there was no change in weight, no positive change. They didn't publish it, but they published a study in 2006, the same group, and actually, those who ate more olive oil, more nuts, got fatter. Big surprise. So I suspect when that data comes out, you'll see those on the Mediterranean diet adding nuts, which is what they recommended, and adding olive oil, which is what they recommended, also gained weight, because we see that in people in the Mediterranean. If you look at obese people in the Mediterranean, you see they eat high-fat diets. You see they eat low-carbohydrate diets. Sure, they eat olive oil, a lot of olive oil, and they become obese, as you would expect. But industry paid for this. There were two Spanish companies. This was published in Spain, done in Spain. Two Spanish companies that produce olive oil. One Spanish company that produced nuts. And also a California company that produced nuts that sponsored this study. Not just the study, the promotion so that you and all your friends heard about it. So industry will not stop. They will do anything possible. And they can influence the best medical journals in the world to get in bed with them to do this kind of dishonesty. The Dietary Goals of the United States, back in 1977, they covered something else that's really near and dear to me. People tell me sometimes, I've heard through my career, they say, you know, McDougall, if you just stick to the diet stuff, you'd be OK. Yeah, we like you a lot better. But you get involved in the medicine stuff, too. You, know, you tell people that they shouldn't have these uh, early detection tests and this heart surgery and take all these blood pressure pills and these diabetic pills. Why don't you just keep with the diet stuff? We'll go with that. Well, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm a board-certified internist. My interest is in my patients, and they need to know the failures of modern medicine, as George McGovern and his group recognized well and published in the Dietary Guidelines. What they said is, as a nation, we have come to believe that medicine and medical technology can solve our major health problems. The role of such important factors as diet and cancer and heart disease has long been obscured by the emphasis on the conquest of these diseases through the miracles of modern medicine. Treatment, not prevention, has been the order of the day. The problems can never be solved merely by more and more medical care. They couldn't then, they can't be now, and they never will be. You cannot successfully treat dietary diseases with drugs and surgery. You may be able to temporize a few things, get rid of a few symptoms, but the cost is huge and the patients suffer. So what I recommend 36 years later, just a few topics. And we're going to get into some of these during this weekend. I recommend that we put an end to treating aggressively type 2 diabetes with insulin and diabetic pills. Why? Because the studies say you hurt patients. How many of the studies? Well, six out of six. In 2008, they had three major studies. The Accord, the Advance, and the Veterans Study, published in uh, 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Three major studies. And all three studies showed they hurt patients. In fact, the Accord study, the first one, had to be stopped 17 months early by the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute because they dramatically increased the risk of death and heart disease in those who were aggressively treated with insulin and pills. The next study, the advance and the veteran study showed similar results. You hurt people by this aggressive treatment. So it needs to be stopped. And George McGovern would have been happy for me to say that. Treatment of elevated cholesterol does not save lives. Our speaker this evening, Dr. John Aberson, and tomorrow is going to share that data with you. He's going to tell you how this uh, aggressive treatment of cholesterol, so aggressive that many doctors say we should put these statins in our drinking water, is bad medicine, a dietary disease. 
not just elevated cholesterol, but the resulting damage to the arteries. Multiple sclerosis, we're uh, finishing up a study on MS at Oregon Health Science University that our foundation funded, and all the patients who went through the study are taken care of by our staff. We're just finishing a study on treating multiple sclerosis with our diet. Well, you know what, even if we don't show any benefit, we're doing better than what the neurologist is doing with the medications, which by the way cost forty to $50,000 just for the drug for a year for these MS drugs, and they don't work. They do not reduce the risk of death and disability. So we should stop that too. Lowering blood pressure with medications does not save lives unless you take care of people with really, really high blood pressure. But most of you and your friends, I'm talking about 98% of you, who are on blood pressure pills, the data does not support the benefits you're looking for. Uh, heart surgery. Heart surgery started in 68, angioplasty in 1978. There have been three major studies done all show the same thing. The benefits are minimal at best and probably does nothing in terms of reducing the risk of dying of heart disease. I remember my son and I, Craig, we got into a little discussion when he was finishing his last year of medical school. You know how children are, they really don't think their parents know that much. <laughs> but he got on cardiology and called me up one day and he said, Dad, you know, I just finished seeing seven patients who went for angioplasty, you know, where they stick the catheter up in the heart and put the stents in. Seven patients, I asked the doctors, why are you doing this? Expecting them to say, well, we're going to save their lives. Here's the data on why they're saving their lives. He said, Dad, he said, they, none of them could say or show me any evidence that they were doing this to improve the patient's survival at all, period. All the studies, and we looked at 28 of them over the next couple of days, all the studies show the same thing. No improvement in survival. We're going to stop that. Should have stopped it 36 years ago. Treatment of di common dietary cancers like breast, prostate, ovary, and colon fail to save lives. This aggressive therapy that takes and ruins families. You know, the, the entire inheritance is gone, spending on medications and surgeries and radiations that have been proven for the last 50 years not to work. And we still do this. George McGovern told us to stop it. And early detection tests. Oh, boy. I should spend a whole hour talking about this form of disease mongering. Disease mongering is where you turn healthy people into patients. What better way to collect a whole bunch of patients than to turn loose these early detection tests, which don't work, need to be stopped, plain and simple, by and large. PSAs, mammograms, breast self-examinations of limited value at best and of tremendous harm and cost to this country. These are dietary diseases. Every one of these problems I mentioned to you is caused by the rich Western diet, and in almost every case, bar the cancers, is dramatically improved or cured with a healthy diet. And we've known that for 50 years. Well, in about 1979, I had a chance to meet another mentor who was very important in my life. His name was Nathan Pritikin. He was not a doctor. He was a scientist. He was an engineer did work on uh, various chemical projects and engineering project. Very brilliant man, Nathan Pritikin was. And he died at 69 years of age. Uh, when I met him, it was uh, in uh, 1979. He came to Hawaii to give some lectures. And uh, turned out I wanted to meet the man. I had heard him. I'd heard about him. And uh, something else happened to me that I want to share with you. I discovered these things on the plantation. I discovered my patients. Uh, could stay healthy eating rice like the Japanese, the Filipinos, the Chinese did. I, I knew all that. And I started discovering that the things we were doing with our patients wasn't working. I started going to the library after I left the plantation and went back into medical residency. I started to read the science about heart disease and high blood pressure and so on. I could see it wasn't working. And you could imagine how I felt being the only person who realized this, I thought. And I thought there was something wrong with me. Why do I see this and nobody else sees this? And I was a little frightened, too. And then I had an opportunity to get a set of audio tapes. It just kind of came into my hands, and I listened to Nathan Pritikin talk. And that was in uh, 1979, about uh, three years after I left the plantation, right after I finished my medical residency in internal medicine. And he talked about the same things that I'd been discovering. I no longer felt alone. I no longer felt as afraid as I was. The uh, best paper that I ever read from anybody, ever, was a paper that he published. It was called High Carbohydrates Diet, Diets Maligned and Misunderstood. 
He published that in uh, 1976. And you can find a copy of that paper on my website in my February 2013 newsletter. Great reading. Any of you who are interested in this subject, great reading. You go, my goodness, we knew all this 30 years ago. Why are we not acting? What is going on? Well, we had some time to spend together in 1979. Mary and I, we had a little track house and on, the, on the windward side of Oahu, and we invited uh, Nathan Pritting and his wife Eileen over for dinner. Very humble, humble place, to tell you the least. And uh, Mary make, made a pasta dinner with some bread and a salad and a soup and a little peach pie for dessert. He said he really liked it. And uh, we became friends at that moment. I developed rather serious cornea insufficiency. We know that as heart disease. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 40, back in 1955. But I was convinced I had to change my diet before I developed the problem. And that is before it became symptomatic. But you didn't. No, I did. But I was thinking about it. Oh, I, uh, I, I remember two or three years, by the early 50s, I was convinced there was no question about what I had to do. Mm -hmm. My cholesterol was running at about 300 in those days. And, but my doctors kept telling me it's in the high normal range, don't worry about it. In fact, it was so bad, if I had a patient now with the kind of test that I had developed, I wouldn't let him out of the room. I didn't give up the ice cream immediately. I just gave up everything. I just completely switched my whole diet to that of the undeveloped countries. Yeah, they were your model because nobody else was around to tell you what to do. Worse than that, everyone that was around told me not to do it. They said it didn't make any difference. And if you did it, were there any risks? Did they tell you? Oh, yes. Risk of malnutrition. So he was about 42 years old, and uh, it was actually February of uh, 1958 that he was diagnosed with asymptomatic coronary artery disease. He flunked his treadmill test. As I told you, his cholesterol, as he told you, his cholesterol was close to 300. It was actually 280, his cholesterol. And he decided to save his own life that he would become informed. This was a brilliant man, a genius. And so what he did is he looked into the scientific literature and came to similar conclusions that I'd come to, that Dr. Dennis Burkett had come to, and many, many other people had come to also. And he changed his diet, saved his own life, and then went on to do multiple scientific studies. He and his group have published over 100 scientific papers in the peer-reviewed journals. He set up uh, a couple of centers in California where people came, thousands of people came, over 3,000 people came to his centers to undergo the treatment, which involved the same thing I do today, putting people on a starch-based diet, very low in fat, no, almost no animal foods he used. We used no animal foods at all, and take them off their medication back then. He became very famous, especially after he was on 60 Minutes one evening, where he showed people who were virtually dying recover in just a matter of a few weeks, few days they got better, and a few weeks they were better, dramatically better, running on treadmills. And that was a 60, minute pre 60 Minutes presentation. It was probably one of the most popular that was ever put on TV. Uh, Mr. Pritikin's uh, cholesterol level, uh, by the way, it dropped dramatically. You can see his cholesterol is dropping here, 162, 122, 120, 102, 119. So he carefully monitored his cholesterol levels to see how he was doing. And of course, he felt fantastic. This is a man who is essentially dying of heart disease at 42 years of age because of clogged arteries. When I saw what happened after the war, and I began to see that it was only the fat and cholesterol that seemed to have made the difference, I then started to investigate countries around the world that were on a very low fat and cholesterol diet. In fact, I looked at the range of the world's population, and I picked out countries on the very lowest fat and cholesterol intake. And I was amazed to find that there were 25 populations I was able to study that heart disease practically didn't exist. And no heart attacks in the country? No, unheard of. You couldn't find a case to show to a medical student. It's amazing. And not only heart disease, but diabetes, hypertension, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, arthritis, glaucoma. That's all, all I treat as a doctor. <laughs> Where are all these diseases? Uh, and these were uh, under hundreds of millions of people. And here I thought these were the natural, inevitable consequence of aging and that everybody has to die of one of these diseases. And now I find that populations don't die of those. They actually die of old age, which is unheard of in this country. And uh, if you look back at the scientific data uh, of 
various disease patterns around the world, you find exactly like what she shows. It's almost disappearing. You have to look quickly because populations in Asia and in Central America, they're becoming quickly westernized and they're losing their immunity to disease that they acquired because they ate a starch-based diet and had very little meat, no dairy, and very little oil in their diet. And we see in Western Europe, for example, as uh, Mr. Prinnikin was talking about, we see how uh, d death from diabetes, for example, uh, back in 1905, it increases in 1905, the death rate from diabetes in Western Europe. This happens to be in England and Wales. And then World War, II, World War I came along and food became scarce. People had to switch back to a starch-based diet and the death rate from heart disease dr dropped dramatically. In this case, the death rate from diabetes dropped dramatically. People with multiple sclerosis stopped having attacks. People generally got much healthier in a time of tremendous stress, World War I. World War I ended, and then the uh, good foods returned, and then uh, we get out here to 1939 when World War II came along, and the same kind of food restriction occurred. People couldn't afford to eat the butter and the beef, and as a result of the switch in diet, all these diseases that are diseases that plague you once and your friends and relatives still, all these diseases virtually disappeared, and they went away very quickly. Like, for example, in Denmark, where they had to change their diet during World War I. Between 1914 and 1918, they stopped eating the animals. They instead ate the food that the animals ate. And as a consequence, during that period of time in Denmark, between 1914 and 1918, the mortality, the death rate among the Danish people, these are three million people that became vegetarian. The death rate dropped 34%. It's the lowest death rate that Denmark has ever seen. So Mr. Pritikin, he wrote a book in 1977. It didn't even have his name as uh, the lead author. He said he was afraid. He said he didn't think anybody would listen to him unless he had some credentials. And so he put a couple other PhDs in the beginning of the book. And he wrote Live Longer Now back in 1977 and tried to tell people about eating a healthy diet, set up a couple of centers in California over the next couple of years. Could you explain a little bit about the diet that you use for people, what it consists of? Yes, uh, a whole grain diet permits you to use a lot of pasta dishes, spaghetti, lasagna, pizza, made to our recipes, of course. Uh, the noodle dishes are brown rice, of course, and all the brown rice kinds of dishes you can make. Uh, and corn, uh, corn is a very popular way to handle things because you can make tortillas, a lot of things that uh, uh, Mexico dishes that we have incorporated. And then the other grains, uh, millet and so on, has been popular in Eastern countries. There uh, are many, many entrees that we have, but they're very versatile because we take any foreign cuisine and translate them into our kind of menu. So Mr. Pritikin uh, visited Hawaii again in, uh, in 1982 and he spent some more time with Mary and I actually spent two days with this man. There are only two people I've ever met in my career who I could er hardly wait till the next word spilled from their lips and Mr. Pritikin was one of them. And I spent two days with him and I took him to the Hawaii PBS TV station and I filmed this back in 1982, uh, hoping that someday this record would be important for you and to help me share a very important and solid, solid message, something we've known for, for decades, even though I know you get confused when your friends come out and tell you, oh no, the way to be healthy is to eat more olive oil, more nuts, or go on the paleo diet, or give up all starch completely. Don't eat any potatoes, any rice, just eat meat. You get confused. Well, the science isn't confusing. It's the scientific gurus out there, pseudo-scientific gurus out there, that are teaching you nonsense, but I know you don't realize it, and I know your friends don't realize it. Well, anyway, uh, we were on his visit in 1982, uh, we had him out to the Kaneo Yacht Club for a potluck dinner. I had 225 of my patients attend, and they brought uh, McDougal-style meals. And uh, Nathan Pritting and his wife Eileen, we had a great dinner together. He said he loved the food. I mean, he really loved the food. I know he was sincere, and we walked out to the parking lot together to help him to his car, and Mary handed him a hundred of her recipes and said, here, you can use these, because the Pritikin program had a reputation for having unimaginative and 
rather tasteless food. And uh, we knew it could be better because we ate this way, and Mary is a genius when it comes to kitchens and recipes and so on. So she gave him 100 recipes. His next book, which is called The Pretty Can Promise, 28 Days to a Longer, Healthier Life, it has an acknowledgment here uh, to Dr. and Mrs. John McDougall for providing the recipes and other help for his book. Not true. The acknowledgment should have been only to Mary McDougall. She changed. Based on what happened, she changed the Pritikin program because since that time, their food improved dramatically. So you got you, I got you to the point of uh, realizing that some people are telling you you should eat a lot of starch, vegetables, and fruits, but you're still worried. You're still worried about where you're going to get your calcium, where you're going to get your protein. I know you're concerned, even though the science is solid. Even though, even though the scientists out there who are by and large bought by industry, who have a huge microphone because they got all the money, they keep telling you otherwise. First of all, on calcium, the World Health Organization, that's part of the United Nations, was given the task of getting together cases of calcium deficiency uh, so they can report at one of the conferences. They're very embarrassed when the conference came up, and here's what their report was. We're sorry to advise you, we can't find one case of calcium deficiency in the entire world's literature. That's the last thing we have to worry about is calcium deficiency. Seems like a whole industry is based on advertising their product. They certainly are. Uh, why does the United States have the highest calcium requirement in the entire world, 800 milligrams a day minimum? Why is it that the World Health Organization only requires 400 milligrams of calcium a day? Why is it that a Bantu woman that has nine children during her lifetime and breastfeeds two years at a time only needs 350 milligrams of calcium a day? It's because we have what we call the National Dairy Council in our country. That's why we have such a high requirement. These Bantu women, women as I remember, are very healthy. They have all their teeth and they right. have very strong bones. Very strong bones, and more than that, the reason they retain all their calcium is because they're on a low-protein diet. So protein has something to do with calcium? It certainly has. If you take more than 16% of your calories in protein, you go into negative calcium balance. That is, you'll spill more calcium out through your urine than you'll take in my mouth, even if you drink two quarts of milk a day. Okay, if you look around the world, <clears throat> this data is since Pritikin's time, uh, but you see some uh, important epidemiologic data. Remember, I told you you need to look, when you look at diseases that vary by environment, you need to look at the food. That's where you contact the world. And so what we find when we compare hip fracture rates with calcium intake, we find a straight line correlation. The more calcium consumed in a country, the more hip fractures. This is data you cannot argue against. And those who consume very little calcium, like those uh, Women in uh, Uganda that Dr. Burke had talked about, he had direct experience with. He took care of 10 million people in 17 years. He observed their health. Couldn't find any fractures in these black rural women. None. So you find people who live on these kind of uh, low dairy product, uh, starch-based diets, avoid hip fractures as you increase the calcium intake worldwide, you increase the hip fracture rate, and the reason for that is because you increase the animal protein intake. As you increase the animal protein intake, you increase the hip fractures, and that's because protein has a negative effect on the bones because protein itself increases bone loss by increasing glomerular filtration rate, but something else happens. Proteins are made of amino acids, acids, amino acids, and the acids that are present in animal foods are very acidic. They contain the amino acids in animal foods, have a high amount of what we call sulfur-containing amino acids, which metabolize into sulfuric acid. And so you dump this huge acid load into the system as a consequence of eating these high acid foods. The bones have to dissolve and neutralize the acid, and that's how you lose the bones. And then the acid goes to the kidneys, the sulfur-containing amino acids change the kidney physiology, the high protein increase increases the glomerular filtration, due to the solute load. I mean, all this science was known in the 1980s and earlier. So when you eat these high protein, high acid foods like dairy, which happens to be the most acidic of all foods, poultry, eggs, uh, meat, and seafood, you end up taking in an acid load. The bones have to dissolve to neutralize the acid. Uh, fruits and vegetables are alkaline. You can see something here called the renal acid load. 
And of all foods that we eat, uh, the most acidic is cheese. And then you see this positive acid load here of fish and chicken and beef. Legumes and grains have a little bit of acid, but not so much the body can't handle it. And plus, we eat our foods mixed with a lot of alkaline fruits and vegetables. If it's a negative sign, it means alkaline, so you're eating a lot of alkaline foods along with your grains. And so the Pritikin diet, Burkitt's recommendation, and my recommendation, as so many are out there that tell you the same thing, are alkaline-based diets which keep your bones intact. How about protein? You got over the calcium thing. It's impossible to have inadequate protein if you eat enough calories to maintain your weight. You couldn't design a diet low enough in protein to get yourself in a protein deficiency. Even if you're a skilled dietitian, you'd have a real tough time. Yet it seems that almost every time you speak or make a statement, there's a dietitian or some other expert who turns around and says that uh, you can't get enough protein or possibly enough calcium in the diet or all the amino acids. Why does this type of information keep getting stated? You, you find this hard to believe, but I'm faced with people saying vegetable proteins are an incomplete protein. And I say, what does it mean to be an incomplete protein? They say, well, it doesn't have all its amino acids. Yet every vegetable protein ever analyzed has every amino acid known to man. If a protein really wants to find one without its amino acids, I can point out two of you, and they're both animal proteins. Gelatin doesn't have all its amino acids. Albumin from egg white, the white of egg doesn't have all its amino acids. They're still good proteins, but you can't criticize vegetable proteins because they have every amino acid. And this was all shown by William Rose, who published his studies before 1953, where he studied the amino acid and protein intakes in people. And since those studies were published, he published 17 of the most important papers in the biochemical journals that have ever been published. William Rose did. Nobody should ever have made the statement, you cannot get adequate protein from vegetables or get all the essential amino acids, because it's absolutely false. You have a lot of controversy surrounding you, and a lot of people uh, uh, would like to see you fail, I think. There's no question about that. You are sort of a lone person standing up there giving a different message for people to follow, and you have quite a following. I'm not alone anymore. I think if I would disappear from the earth today, the movement would grow, and uh, it's, it's too late to stop it. Yeah, I, I think that too, but there have been a lot of bumps along the way. Uh, if Nathan Pritikin wouldn't have died at 69, if he'd lived another decade or two, I don't believe the new Atkins diet revolution would have gone any place. And you'd have never heard about the paleo diet. This man was so strong, so smart, he'd have put the end to that nutritional nonsense. But unfortunately, he did pass away at age 69. And at his autopsy, he made one more strong statement. Remember, he almost died of heart disease at age 42. At 69, when they did a careful autopsy, what they found is that Several systemic arteries showed some yellow flat streaks. No elevated plaques were present and no reduction of lumen was found. No infarcts of any size or other findings referable to the vascular disease were present in any organ. In a man 69 years old, the near absence of atherosclerosis and the complete absence of, his, of its effects are remarkable. Well, in 1988, in 1988, uh, Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, who just died last week, he uh, Tried again, again trying to mimic Luther Terry's efforts. Uh, 1964 Surgeon General report on smoking, which did make a huge difference. In 1964, the Surgeon General uh, told us that smoking cigarettes would kill you. And back in 1964, half the population smoked cigarettes. And people listened. And what happened was we have a population now where less than fewer than 20% of people smoke. So it does make a difference when governments get together with the scientific data and make recommendations. People will change if they're told what they're supposed to do. The difference is with cigarettes, half the people could see the insanity. With food, less than 0.001% can see the insanity. Everybody's eating the American diet, they can't see it. The tobacco industry is tiny compared to the food industries. So it just never caught on. Even though Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, who died last week at age 96, he got together with the 
with the members of his uh, department, of the Surgeon General, and they published a book. It's called The Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. And it told people, it told them to stop eating fat and cholesterol, particularly saturated fat. Do you know what saturated fat means? That means eggs and dairy and meat. That's saturated fat. Now, of course, they don't use that terminology because industry doesn't want you to hear it. When they refer to the negative effects of a diet back then and still today, they use the term saturated fat because the meat and dairy industry prohibit them from using the terms meat and dairy. They're not allowed to do it. Well, we've uh, tried to make some progress along the way, and uh, as a result, we, since the 1980s, we've had the dietary guidelines for the United States, and they've tried to tell people to eat healthier. They've not been allowed to use the terms meat and dairy. They've had to refer to the damaging, killing foods as saturated fats and cholesterol. They still do in the 2010 report. They still have to use this terminology. But they have made step forward the dietary guidelines. For example, the ones in 2010, Americans were told to emphasize nutrient-dense foods and beverages, vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, fat-free and low-fat milk, milk products, seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, beans, peas, nuts, and seeds. They could have easily, if they wouldn't have had industry's influence, they could have easily left off the low-fat dairy products, the seafoods, the lean meats, poultry, and eggs. And then they'd have had an honest report for Americans. They even mentioned in this 2010 report the, uh, the positive effects of some diets out there that are in this direction, like the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet. And they even talked about vegetarian and vegan diets. So progress is being made, but millions of people are dying senselessly. This all should have been solved in the early 70s. Well, it's not solved because our government answers to different, uh, different influences. The USDA, for example, it's supposed to be the department that protects us from bad health and solves our obesity problems, but it doesn't. The United States Department of Agriculture was created in 1865 by Abraham Lincoln. He called it the People's Department. But the United States Department of Agriculture, it answers to agribusiness. And what it's turned out to be is the agribusiness department. I uh, first met Barack Obama. In fact, it's the only time I met him uh, when he was a student at Punahou High School. He was 15 years old. And I had the opportunity to lecture at Punahou High School. And there was a very enthusiastic crowd. I came at least once a year, and I lectured at Punahou High School. And I got just a huge crowd of students. And I remember one time after a lecture, uh, four young men walked up to me and started grilling me about the things I was talking about. And one particular man stood out. And the reason was he was black. And everybody else was Asian and white. So I do remember him. He was there. And I've even checked with uh, some of the faculty there. And he, he was there. So he heard my message. Back, uh, back uh, between 1975 and 1979, I don't know how many times he went to my lectures. But he knows I was still saying the same thing back then I'm saying now. He knows this. And Barack Obama has had lots of other experiments, experiences that tells you he knows about a starch-based diet. Not only did he hear me, but when he lived in Hawaii, he saw the same things I saw. He saw Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos living on rice and vegetables being trim, and how when the meat was introduced into the diet, people became more typical American. They got fat and sick. They're some of the fat, fattest and sickest people in this country in Hawaii. He saw that. In his first years of life, he lived in Indonesia for five years, where 98% of the food from people from Indonesia came from vegetables. He saw this. And then he spent, he spent about five weeks in Kenya in 1988, where in Kenya they live basically on corn. They eat this kind of diet. So he's seen these things. He knows. Our president knows, regardless of what your political leaning is, I don't care. We have an administration that knows the truth. As countries like China and India become wealthier, then they start changing their food habits. They start eating more meat, more animal. Uh, and, and what happens then is because it takes more grain to produce a pound of beef than uh, if they were just eating the grain, what ends up happening is, is that it puts huge pressure on food supplies. Now, Americans would actually benefit from a change in diet. I don't think that, I don't think that, I don't think that that's something, I don't think that that's something that we should legislate. Uh, but I think that it is something that as part of our overall health care system, we should encourage. Because, for example, if we reduced obesity down to the rates that existed in 1980, 
we would save the Medicare system a trillion dollars. We would reduce diabetes rates. We would reduce heart disease. So, and, and, and so the fact that we subsidize some of these big agribusiness operations that are not necessarily producing healthy food, and we discourage or we don't subsidize farmers who are producing fruits and vegetables and small-scale farming that gets produce immediately to uh, consumers as opposed to having it processed. The fact that we're not doing more to make sure that healthy food is in the schools. All those things don't make sense. And I think it does, it is important for us to re-examine our overall food policy so that we're encouraging good habits and not bad habits. For example, you know, just making sure that there are more fruits and vegetables in school lunch programs, that would make an enormous difference in how our children's diets develop. That would make us healthier over the long term. It would cut our health care costs, and maybe it would help uh, people elsewhere in the world who are in le less wealthy countries feed themselves as well. Okay, so our president knows these things. There is a real possibility that we could change the world, I think. He knows the environmental consequences of eating animals. He knows the financial penalties, the cost of having a sick nation. Basically, everybody's sick in this country, and he knows why. He knows our kids are being harmed. Now, civilized people at least protect their children. And he knows the worldwide implications. We're living in a, living in a very volatile world where you know, more than half the people are starving, and we're dying of gluttony. And uh, his wife is right there to support him. She knows the difference, too. She was on Jay Leno's show, and she had a nice time with Jay one evening. I have a challenge brought? for you. Well, that looks like pizza. That looks this, delicious. This is, ooh, it's pizza. Mmm, smell. That, that does smell very good. That does smell very good. But it I is I assume this is sausage and pepperoni? With, it's sausage, pepperoni, you know. It's a veggie pizza. A oh, veggie pizza. And okay. I, you know, this is a good way for yeah. people of your ilk who ilk? don't like vegetables <laughs> to incorporate them. See? Yeah, mmm. Ooh, yeah. Jay eating veggies. You know, and, and on that, that's got tomatoes, it's got zucchini, it's got green peppers, it's got a little eggplant, it's on a whole wheat crust. Now that's a pizza. You like it, don't you? Oh, it's pretty good. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's a start. We'll put some sausage and pepperoni on it. <laughs> what you, now what, what you do you I understand you, like me, love French fries. I love French fries. These are sweet potato fries. Sweet potato fries. And they are baked instead of... Oh, so they're French baked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the potential is there. I've uh, been bidding for the job of Surgeon General for most of my career. And uh, if I ever get the chance... If I ever get the chance to speak to our government, and I'm doing more so all the time, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that on Sunday. If I ever get a chance to have the kind of influence I'd like to have to continue the messages of Dr. Dennis Burkett and Nathan Pritikin and other brilliant people who've made this very simple discovery as to why we're sick and how to solve the problems. I'm gonna tell our administration and anybody else who will listen, several things. It's time to reintroduce and uh, expand the 1977 dietary, this is 36 years ago. Regardless of what the meat and dairy industry say, we have a right to know the truth in a strong country and not sick people. How are we going to solve unemployment? How are we going to keep our country safe with a whole population of sick people? Update and implement the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health. Let's do it in celebration of C. Everett Koop and his brilliant life and how much he brought to this country. Start with insisting truth in advertising and provide warning labels. When you buy beef, it should say warning. This food is polluting your streams and lakes and, lakes and oceans. Or when you buy eggs, they should say, warning, this will give you a heart attack. And when you buy cheese, it should say, warning, your risk of heart disease and stroke and obesity and type 2 diabetes is dramatically increased, just like they do on cigarettes. Truth in advertising. The data is far larger than what implicates cigarette smoking. But of course, the money's big, too. We need to reduce, remove prejudicial affiliations in the food industry. 
USDA, we can no longer have a revolving door policy where one year a member of the USDA works for the meat and dairy industry and the next year they work for the USDA. Revolving door policy. These people have uh, interests in probably the American people, but they certainly still have ties and interest in industry and that needs to stop. We need to require Congress stop subsidizing unhealthy farming. We should maybe stop at all, but at least we shouldn't subsidize the meat and the dairy industry like we do. Industries that are killing people. We should put a fat tax on meat, dairy, and fish and eggs. Yeah, just like we do cigarettes. Let's put a fat tax on them and let people pay some of our medical costs with this extra tax. There are a lot of people who need help in this country and they're on food stamp programs, but the sad thing is, is the very foods we're feeding the least privileged people in this country are making them fat and sick. And then we have to turn around and pay for it with the government subsidy health programs. This makes no sense at all. Sure, you can have food stamps, but you can buy potatoes and rice and corn and fruits and vegetables. Just like you can't buy cigarettes and alcohol, you're not going to be able to buy beef and pork and eggs. No, that's not allowed. And we need to develop campaigns to feed our kids properly. They're trying to feed the kids better these days, but they put them on a diet of green and yellow vegetables and they're starving to death. They've told, the USDA has told the school lunch programs they're to limit starch to one cup a week. The traditional food of human beings, one cup a week. The WIC program, the only food that you can't buy with WIC coupons is potatoes. You can buy the bacon bits, you can buy the cheese, you can buy the sour cream, but you cannot buy the potato. We gotta require all government uh, supported nutrition programs to serve starch-based diets. That means our military, we have a fat sick military. They have to be fed properly so they can defend us. All government agencies, all government school programs to serve school lunches. Our administration could stop feeding bad foods tomorrow if they wanted to. We need to have doctors prescribe diet therapy under Obamacare. In other words, you come with a dietary disease, you as a doctor will be penalized for using medications. You'll be rewarded for getting your patient healthy by encouraging them to change their diet. That's what we need to do. And uh, this, I know funding is a very sensitive subject these days, but the money that we're wasting, let's spend it on a massive re-education campaign. Let's teach people the truth. Let's get our country back to the country that it once was and could be again a leader in health and everything else. The way we're going now, we don't stand a chance. The future is ours to change. The future is ours to create. And if we're well informed and this information is solid, it dates back for thousands of years. It is the truth. We just have to start implementing. We have to have the strength to stand up and say what's right, stand up against industry, continue to encourage people to eat well. And it's the final message I'd like to leave for you before we go to a delicious starch-based dinner. <laughs> is when people ask you about diet, people ask you why you look so trim and healthy and gorgeous, you know, stand up to them and say, it's because I eat a starch-based diet. I gave up meat and dairy. You know, don't just turn around and walk away and say, well, you know, why bother? Why bother telling them they get all the protein you want and all the calcium you need in a healthy diet? You know, it's too many people just say, well, let, let, let bygones be bygones, and why ruffle things up? Why, why make an issue out of it? Well, I'm here to tell you, make an issue out of it. Uh, maybe our future, most of it is in the room, our futures are limited because of our age. But we have generations to come. We have children and grandchildren that deserve a better world. They deserve a world that they can live in. And it's crucial that we get the food problem solved for us to have a sustainable planet Earth. And we have the information. We just have to have the will to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.